One, two, three. One, two, three.
you to say he is up north, maybe? He's definitely at, he's at a funeral this morning or yesterday, sometime in the year. Megan? Yes. I don't think you have the mic on. Oh. It's good to know. It says I do. Okay. Maybe You're I don't have it in a good spot.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of creation, eternal majesty, you preside over land and sea, sunshine and storm. By your strength, pilot us. By your power, preserve us. And by your wisdom, instruct us. And by your hand, protect us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, the first reading for today is from Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 7. At the end of the book of Job, after Job and his companions have argued about the cause of the great suffering Job endures, God finally speaks. These verses begin that speech, which is a grand vision of creation, describing God's ordering of the cosmos and inviting Job to marvel at its beauty. A reading from Job. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out, of, of, out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, in thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Psalm for today is Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3. 23 through 32. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, for God's mercy endures forever. And the Lord redeem them from the hand of the foe. Gathering them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They beheld the works of the Lord, God's wonderful works in the deep. Then God spoke, and the storm in the river rose, which tossed high the waves of the sea. They mounted up to the heavens and descended to the depths. Their souls melted away in their peril. Then in their trouble they cried to the Lord, you delivered them from their distress. You still the storm to whisper, and silence the waves of the sea. Then were they glad when it grew calm, when you guided them to their harbor they desired. Let them exalt you in the assembly of the people. In the council of the elders, let them sing hallelujah. Second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Paul and his fellow workers experienced great hardships and even rejection while carrying out their missionary work. Nevertheless, Paul continuously proclaims that God has not rejected us, but is graciously working for our salvation. A reading from 2 Corinthians. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience,
kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet nothing possess and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children, open wide your hearts also. Word of God, word of life.
Father, thank you for gathering us here this morning as we gather for worship. Help us to remember that even though sometimes we feel all twisted inside, you are there to help calm the seas and bring order back to our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus' calming of the storm on the sea reveals his power over evil, since the sea represents evil and chaos. The boat on the sea is a symbol of the church and invites us to trust God amid life turbulence. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. When evening had come, Jesus said to the disciples, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them, with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And Jesus woke up and rebuked the sea, the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. And Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And the disciples were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. So I think by now you all have probably heard enough sermons from me to know that I like to kind of start my sermons by situating it into its context, and today's not going to be any different. So, today's gospel comes after a series of parables, all building upon who Jesus is and how he fits into the kingdom of God. And for most of the last three chapters of Mark, Jesus has been proclaiming that the kingdom of God is coming near, and with it will come repentance and the fulfillment of the good news. And in biblical literature, Mark's gospel is what's known as apocalyptic literature, which is basically a revelation or an unveiling of something that was not previously known. And so we would, be, we would maybe be wise to keep our apocalyptic glasses on as we read about Jesus' trip on the boat and the stilling of the storm. In a commentary I read for today by David Jacobson, he summed it up pretty well by saying that this mean, that that means that this is not just another boat ride, but the apocalyptic boat ride from hell. And this is not just another miracle either, but an apocalyptic revelation of Jesus' identity. And so on one hand, this boat ride means that the trouble the disciples are facing on this boat is not just existential or like the storms of life, but it's cosmic, it's more universal. And like most apocalypses, Mark's gospel sees the trouble that Jesus faces as cosmic in scope. And as if to kind of underscore this, Jesus faces down the storm, not with kind of personal advice to the disciples, saying something like, you have to face your fears, guys, come on. But he silences the storm and rebukes it. And these two words, this rebuke that Jesus uses, are... They're kind of different words in Mark's gospel. They're really only used to condemn, to rebuke demons. And, and so they're more cosmic and it's just, it's a little more demonic and it's worthy of Jesus kind of scaling up his efforts. And then on the other hand, 
This apocalyptic revelation means that the point of the boat miracle should be a disclosure. The focus here is not really on the mysterious kingdom of God, but more on Jesus himself. The fact that Jesus stills the storm with a word of rebuke also tells us something about him. The way there is a little difficult. In the midst of the tossing waves of the storm, the disciples refer to Jesus as teacher. And after they witness the stilling of the storm, all the disciples have a deep awe or a great fear, as the Greek says, with deep questions. Who is this? Who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey? Who is this Jesus? If we back up a little bit in this text, we're still left with a lot of questions. We know from this text that it must be pretty early in Jesus's ministry because his disciples still don't really understand who he is. Um, we can also assume that maybe the disciples haven't been with Jesus for very long, as it mentions that they bring Jesus onto the boat just as he was, which is a phrase that when I was reading over the gospel for this week, I got a little stuck on, just as he was. What does that even mean? Did the disciples look at Jesus, the son of a carpenter's wife, who, turned, who became a rabbi, and go, well, I don't think he knows anything about sailing, but whatever, we'll take him anyway. Was this Jesus, a man who apparently went immediately to sleep in the stern of the boat as soon as he got on board, tired and maybe cranky like some of us can get when we need a good nap? Whatever the case may be, Whatever shape Jesus must have been in for Mark to clarify that they took him just as he was, we can still see the grace that the disciples share with him. The disciples take this tired rabbi who has been preaching parables to all day to crowds of people, this rabbi who wants to cross the Sea of Galilee right now, as opposed to waiting until the safer seas of the morning, and they see, sit Jesus down in the depths of the boat, and they give him some pillows and blankets to sleep just as he was. All these broken, strange little pieces that kind of build on one another to create Jesus, the human, our Lord and Savior. And the disciples just looked at this man and went, yeah, sure, we'll give you a ride across the sea. And then things just get even kind of weirder from there. This rabbi continues to sleep through what must have been an awful storm, the ship being tossed about and flooded, and, I mean, you got to remember that most of the disciples were fishermen. They've probably seen some storms, and they come to the conclusion that this is it. This is the end. So they wake Jesus up, probably so he can pray with them while the ship sinks. And in any case, I don't know, it seems kind of strange to let someone sleep through what they think is going to be the sinking of a ship. I can't really put my finger on why that seems wrong. It just kind of does. And anyway, the disciples, in the midst of the storm, wake Jesus up and are like, dude, we are literally drowning here. Do you not care that we're going to die here? And then the story just gets even weirder. The disciple, Jesus, rebukes the storm. And, and so, as I mentioned earlier, this word is really only used in Mark's Gospels to refer to Jesus rebuking demons, and I, don't, I think that kind of shows even more of the severity of this storm. But anyway, Jesus rebukes the storm, and the winds die down. The seas become quiet, and everything is peaceful once more. And then Jesus, with what I can only imagine is that maybe slightly irritated tone that, you can, that someone who has just been woken up to deal with a minor inconvenience, you know, there's... It's today's Father's Day. Maybe dads know that feeling when their kids wake them up from a nap to say that they want a snack or something. Asks the disciples, why are you afraid? And that's, that's, that's a weird, weird question because the boat's about to sink. And yeah, the boat's about to sink. And if, if you're asking me this here and now, if you're asking, and as Jesus, as the disciples are asking Jesus, you know, it's just kind of really this is what we're doing, and I don't know. Do not be, do not be afraid. Is the single most repeated phrase in Scripture, 
And yet, most of us could probably write a list of our own fears that would stretch to the moon and back several times over. We're afraid of showing up. Maybe we're afraid that no one else will show up. We're afraid of loving others, and we're maybe afraid of being loved. This gospel story takes place after a long day of Jesus teaching the crowds by way of parables and explaining them later to his disciples. And then after, they'll, and after they cross over to the other side of the sea, they'll immediately encounter a herd of pigs and a man who's possessed by demons. And so crossing over to the other side is perhaps just as scary as the here and now. And, we're no, and it's still going to be a lot of work. And it seems that all we can do then is to show up for these crossings just as we are, waiting for someone to ask, why are you afraid? When we cross to the other side, though, we, we aren't alone. Jesus conducts his ministry on the other side, opening minds to new possibilities, setting people free in order to, into, to enter into a new future in freedom and wholeness. And Jesus messes with borders, not because he has a penchant, not because he just likes to mess with borders, but because the reign of God extends divine holiness and a commitment to a human well-being in places that maybe we think sometimes are, are beyond the limits. And to him, no place is desolate and no one is abandoned. So Jesus comes. He banishes harmful spirits. He welcomes outsiders and disadvantaged people, restores communities, and even rebukes storms and calms the seas. Nothing will inhibit his desire to do ministry on the other side. And in the end, it doesn't matter that, that what, what it is that threatens to keep him from crossing the lake. What's more important is that he will not be deterred. When Jesus gets to the other side in, in, the, in the next few verses of Mark, he will not abandon his faithless disciples on the shore. And that's good. He has, more, he has more for them to experience as they continue to witness, to bear witness to who Jesus is and to the act fearfulness that his actions can provoke sometimes from their front row seats throughout, chap throughout the next chapter. And as for them, they'll, as for the disciples, they'll keep getting into boats with Jesus. They'll continue to follow him because that's what he has asked them to do. There's a lot to celebrate and remember during the month of June. It's Pride Month, and with it, we remember the members of the LGBTQIA communities who have kicked off the Civil Rights Movement, and we celebrate the work that's been done in this community. Yesterday was the first time that Juneteenth has been celebrated as a federal holiday, a step in the journey that comes with confronting the racial tensions of our history and present as we head into the future. And at the same time, we celebrate the steps we are taking by honoring Juneteenth as a federal holiday. The ELCA commemorates the Emanuel Nine this past week as well. Nine members of Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, who were shot in their church during a Bible study in an act of racism that spurned out of teachings of the ELCA. Yet, despite all of these tensions in our background, all of these broken pieces of history that make up who we are today, Jesus too welcomes us onto the boat, just as we are. The grace that was shown to Jesus by his disciples, who welcomed the son of a carpenter's wife turned rabbi, who probably quite frankly didn't know too much about sailing, onto their ship at night to cross over to the other side, is turned around onto us. We too are welcomed onto the boat, and Jesus is there to calm the storms in our life. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as you're able for our hymn of the day. It is well with my soul.
called, gathered, enlightened, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Holy God, you gather your people from east and west, north and south. We pray for the mission of the church throughout the world, that your steadfast love may be known to all peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You lay the foundations of the earth, and the waters are the womb of creation. The morning stars sing your name, and all creation shouts for joy. We pray for your blessed creation, that it may continue to flourish and magnify your glory. We pray especially for the areas affected by, our, by water insecurities and for areas of high heat. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. You keep watch over all nations. We pray for countries experiencing violence, hunger, and unrest. Guide worldwide and local community organizations their efforts to establish safety and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. You are close to the brokenhearted and near to those in distress. We pray for those who are experiencing oppression. Liberate us from the systems and chains that bind us. Remove the barriers that separate us from one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You dwell with us in this faith community. We pray for our leaders and elders. Grant them knowledge, patience, and kindness that through their leadership you may be exalted in this assembly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your love endures all situations. On this Father's Day, we pray for those who are fathers or wish to be fathers, for those with broken or strained relationships, for those who are missing their fathers, and for fathers who have lost children. Bless and strengthen them. In this day, we also pray for the family of Maxine Mukla, Paul, Luke, Marilyn, Karen, Pat, Karen, Linda, Kay, John, Lynn, Julie, and all those who have been named before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O oh God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always, and also with you. I invite you now to share a sign of that.
Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be the world's sign of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Um, I just wanted to give you a little update. Some of the council members took a walk through the parsonage the other day, and we identified some of the needs that we'll, we should take care of before Pastor Malik arrives. Um, there's some light fixtures that need updating. Um, I'm pretty sure the ones in the entryway are probably the originals, <laughs> so they need to go. <laughs> Um, the window treatments, uh, we probably will end up putting some blinds uh, in the windows um, and maybe, uh, maybe some drapes in the family room. We'll have to, have to see, but we've identified the windows that need some type of treatment. Um, replacing the carpet in the living room and the family room. And the carpets and all the bedrooms just need to be cleaned. And uh, there's a lot of nail holes that need to be repaired. And along with that, uh, painting, interior painting, there's a lot that needs to be done. So these are all the preliminary needs we identified. We haven't made any decisions to do anything. So if you have any suggestions or comments, questions, be sure and let us know. And um, once we do decide what we are going to do, um, we'll welcome volunteers. There, there's a lot of labor, time labor, that um, we could, any of you could help us with. If you can identify an area that you like to do, just let us know and we'll keep you updated when we're gonna do this, but it's probably gonna be soon. Uh, because we'd like to have it done mid-July or so. And then also, on the exterior, since we missed our cleanup day this past spring um, because of the weather, um, the landscaping needs to be freshened up. And since it's going to be cool this week, if anybody has some free time, they'd like to come and pull weeds or pick up sticks or anything like that, you can just go on over and... and uh, do some of that work for us. And we always know that it's best to feed you when you help us. Mm -hmm. So mark your calendars and remember next Sunday we're having a chicken and biscuit dinner downstairs following the service. And we are offering carryouts. We're hoping to make extra, so if you want another meal during the week, you can take one home with you. So thanks in advance for your support, and I know we've gotten a lot of support already from when Pat spoke a few Sundays ago about the needs of the church, and thanks a lot, because I know we can always depend on all of you. Thank you. We have lifted some more of our COVID restrictions, and so all the signs are gone off of the views now. So there are plenty of seats, and you can sit wherever you feel comfortable. Um, so thank you to thank you to our council for all the work that they've done in the past year and a half as as we deal with COVID on a month to month basis. Um, are there any other any other announcements for the good of the whole this morning? I know there's stuff in the bulletin on the PowerPoint tree, and yeah, there's a lot going on. 
field stands you're able to receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our sending him is Children of the Heavenly Father. We are disciples of Jesus Christ, called to grow in Christ and to invite all to follow him. Go in peace. Christ is with you. <laughs>